Good afternoon. I would like to invite you to this latest event in the Creative Mind Lecture Series, uh, sponsored by the Keller Center. The Keller Center is the place, uh, the university, that uh, tries to foster innovation, entrepreneurship, design thinking, and leadership. And this is our lecture series when, where we try to invite uh, the leaders and thought leaders in the field to come and uh, address the community here. And we're extremely excited today because um, uh, Keith Sawyer is with us. And uh, Keith is somebody that we use in our classes, uh, his work. Uh, so he is somebody that uh, we are um, uh, you know, very honored to have come share his latest work. And his, his body of work is so great that we will only see a small slice of it today. Um, Keith has literally written the book on creativity. Uh, his PhD is in uh, Creative Mind from University of Chicago. And since graduating, he's written countless articles and uh, several very important books. Uh, he is the editor uh, of several editions of the Cambridge Handbook of Learning Sciences. Uh, he has also uh, written the uh, uh, book Structure in Improvisation in Creative Teaching. He, his textbook Explaining Creativity, which you can see we use a lot of, uh, is literally the textbook on creativity. And Keith also shares um, uh, a uh, fairly rare skill of being able to communicate to both the academic community in, in rigorous scientific uh, prose and also to write for um, the general public. And he has two books that uh, have been bestsellers are imp considered important books, go-to books uh, in the field of creativity that are accessible to all of us. Uh, one book uh, is called uh, Group Genius, uh, The Creative Powers of Collaboration. And uh, that was a massive bestseller. And then also uh, Zigzag, The Surprising Path to Greater Creativity. And uh, today in the lecture, Keith will be talking about the, uh, zigzag and, um, and helping us understand how creativity is a skill set, a skill set that we can get better at by practicing, what those skills are. And uh, we're going to hear about a few of them today. Uh, before I ask Keith to come up, though, I do want to uh, mention um, that he's come in from um, Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, where he's the uh, Morgan Distinguished Professor of uh, in Educational Innovation. And uh, so he, he is somebody that uh, is widely revered at UNC, but also widely revered here at uh, Princeton. And so I would like to, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Keith Sawyer. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Derek. And I've been very impressed with the Keller Center and the wonderful things you're doing here on the Princeton campus. I'd like to thank JD in the back for doing all the work setting this up and the reception that we're going to have right afterwards. My passion is helping people be more creative. And that's why I focused my research on the careers of exceptional creative individuals. But also, as a psychology researcher, I really want to understand, as a scientist, what goes on in people's minds when they're being creative. What are the ways of thinking and the ways of acting that are associated with these exceptional creators? So I've spent my career looking at this type of research, psychological research about the nature of the creative process. And my take home message today is going to be, it's a wandering, surprising, zigzagging process. 
the key to being creative is not having one big, surprising flash of insight. Creativity isn't about having a flash of insight. If you're waiting for that one moment of insight, you're going to feel creative block, because <laughs> the moment of insight, it may never come. It's not a good way to be consistently creative. creative. Creativity comes out of small ideas, small sparks over time. And the research can tell you how to have those small sparks more frequently and better. And then the second take home message is, how can you string those small ideas together over time so that they result in something that actually is a big idea, something that really can make a difference in the world. I'm going to start by telling you a story. And it's a story of an exceptional creative process. It's a creative product I think we'd all agree is just a phenomenal success. <laughs> OK, everybody seen this movie? I tried to pick a movie that would fit in with the demographic of who, who I expected to be here maybe when you were children or when you're children's children. This is from 1995. And this is Pixar's movie, the first fully digitally animated full-length feature film uh, created by Pixar for Disney. It's called Toy Story. And you all are going to know the plot. Uh, but I'll just give you quickly, it uh, seems like a classic buddy movie. It's a buddy movie plot. You have two characters. They don't like each other. They have different personalities. They clash. Then they get stuck in a situation where to get out of it, they have to overcome their differences, and they have to work together. So it's a, you know, it seems like this classic plot, and almost like someone at Pixar, John Lasseter, who's credited as the writer, sits down. And he has the big idea, right? He says, I'm going to do a buddy movie, but with puppets. Takes it to Disney. Disney says, that's brilliant. Let's go. And then the linear process where the movie comes out at the end. Well, it turns out that is, nothing could be farther from the truth with how this movie was created. It was very much a wandering, unpredictable process. And the movie that we know and love, it's completely different from the original script treatment. I'm going to give you just a few examples. These are from a book I love. It's called The Pixar Touch. The Pixar Touch, it's a great book about the creative culture at Pixar, the historical relationships between Pixar and Disney, the creative designers, et cetera. So in a book like that, you got to scratch beneath the surface for a lot of these innovations before you can see what really happened under the surface. So here I am reading this book, and this is only a few of the zigs and zags. Um, Pixar wanted to have G.I. Joe as a key character in the movie. So they went to Hasbro, which had the rights to G.I. Joe. And Hasbro said, no, we, we don't think it fits our brand for what we want our G.I. Joe character. So, but you know what? We don't mind if you have Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> so, so John Lasseter at Pixar, they're like, OK, yeah, we can, we can make it work with Mr. Potato Head. So they put Mr. Potato Head in the movie. He was not in the original script treatment. But they didn't get G.I. Joe. They do have little green army men, right? But, but they're not G.I. Joe. Um, another, this is my favorite one. So Barbie is not, right? Barbie is not in Toy Story. But in the original script treatment, they wanted Barbie to lead a commando raid of Amazonian women. <laughs> and they really were going to have Barbie swing in on a vine, and they were going to rescue the two toys. And again, so they went to Mattel. Famously, Mattel owns the brand to Barbie. Mattel said, eh, not really sure that fits with our brand image for Barbie. So you can't have Barbie. Uh, OK, so that was another twist. They had to take the whole Barbie plot out of it. I wish that had been in there. I can just imagine it. Maybe they had storyboard sketched already. Uh, another one, the voice actor for Buzz Lightyear. So imagine in your head the Buzz Lightyear character and what his voice sounds like. Their original choice for the voice actor for Buzz Lightyear, Billy Crystal. And those of you who may know Billy Crystal, he's a uh, sort of a New York kind of accent. Um, it invokes a certain sort of character and personality. So they had written the script for Billy Crystal to be Buzz Lightyear. Well, it turns out Billy Crystal was not available. Had other commitments, so he couldn't do Buzz Lightyear. Their backup was Tim Allen. And again, imagine the voice of Buzz Lightyear is Tim Allen. Well, that's a totally different voice, a completely different personality. So when they realized this was going to happen, they had to rewrite, they had to rescript all of the lines for Buzz Lightyear just to fit. It just didn't work anymore with Tim Allen saying those lines. And this happens over and over again when you go through the story of how this movie got made. These are just the tip of the iceberg 
of those moments, those small ideas that come together over time and then gradually result in a successful creative product, a successful innovation. This was not a brilliant burst of insight. And it wasn't even going to be a buddy movie when they started out. It ended up becoming the classic buddy movie. This is why I talk so much about the zigzagging, wandering process, where you have these small ideas coming together over time. And honestly, not all the small ideas are going to be good ones, right? I mean, I've just told you several examples of dead ends, where you can have ideas that don't necessarily pan out. It's not a linear process. It's wandering. It's branching. It's improvisational. You know, and I spent so much time studying improvisational groups, jazz ensembles, and theater, improvisational theater groups, that I see something very similar when I look at these creative paths. It's a wandering, unpredictable path. It's not about having the big flash of insight, right? The light bulb that goes off over your head. It's about engaging in a deliberate process which consistently leads to successful creative outcomes. So it's deliberate, it's a process, and it consistently leads to creative outcomes. So right, my passion is helping people be more creative. I want you to be more creative like every day for, for life, right? Not just have one big idea and then the rest of your life, it's done, I had my big idea. No, these are practices, ways of thinking, and ways of acting that you can apply every day to consistently generate creativity, creative sparks and creativity over time. I'm going to talk about four different habits of mind today. They're out of the eight habits of mind that I talk about in my book, Zigzag. And these are four particularly important ones that I picked out. The first one, I call it ask, because it really is about coming up with good questions. A lot of people, when they think about needing creativity for a problem, they think about a problem that they have, and then they think, I'm going to solve this problem. I need a creative solution to solve my problem. And it could require creativity. We call that problem solving creativity. But more exceptional creativity happens when you don't know what the problem is. You don't know how to formulate the problem. You don't know exactly how to ask the right question. So you're still sort of seeking a way to define the space. right? You, and that is where you really want to be. You're confused. You don't know exactly what you need to do. You don't know what the endpoint will look like. And you honestly don't know where you're starting until you come up with that question. Well, exceptional creators, they start the process, the deliberate process over time. They start the process even without knowing yet what is the question that they need to solve. Because they trust that once they engage in that process, a question will emerge. A good question will emerge. A formulation of the question that they couldn't have thought of at the beginning, but they needed to start to have the question. So here's an example. Oh, a great example. I love this story. Uh, raise your hand if you have this app on your smartphone. No one's going to raise their hand, right? <laughs> because this app emerged in 2010, and it died really quick death in the market. It's called Bourbon. Bourbon was a location sharing app. And in 2010, location sharing was all the rage because smartphones just started to have GPS on them. So that was incredibly common, increasingly common. There was an app called Foursquare. Raise your hand if you remember Foursquare or if you know what it is. OK, I'm getting most people, right. Foursquare, location sharing app. You check in at a location. If you check in more than anybody else, you are the mayor. Yeah, OK, good. So yeah, you know Foursquare. I actually never used Foursquare. But I, I was looking into it as a result of this incredible, incredible story of discovering a new kind of problem. OK, so a programmer named Kevin Sistrom. He's in Silicon Valley. And he says, I want a piece of this action. You know, location sharing, it's hot. Foursquare is out there, but we can do something different, maybe better. So I'm going to come up with a location sharing app. And this was it, Bourbon. Um, put in tons of features. Uh, location sharing, uh, checking in, social networking with other people who use the app. He put in a, a photo feature, because smartphones, they started to have you know, cameras in them. And so you could take photos. You could share the photos. The app was just not successful. People, some people, you know, a few thousand people downloaded it. Um, Kevin Sistrom brought on another software developer to help him out. You know, what's going on? Um, and this guy was uh, Kevin Krieger. And Krieger said they looked at the, the download data and the usage data, and they discovered that everyone 
was taking photos and sharing photos. But no one was checking in. <laughs> no one was using the location sharing feature. They had ended up doing something really interesting with their photo sharing feature that they hadn't even, they hadn't even noticed it, right? It's kind of like an afterthought. They threw in the photo sharing feature. So they said, oh, you know what? Maybe the world doesn't need another location sharing app, but maybe what the world needs is another photo sharing app. So they tweaked it, they modified it, they turned Bourbon into Instagram, which of course became a huge success as a photo sharing app. This is an example of the question being found while you're engaged in the process. Their initial question was, the problem they posed for themselves was, we need to develop a location sharing app. The world needs a better location sharing app. So that's the problem we're gonna solve. Well, they solved the problem and <laughs> they were wrong. The world didn't need another location sharing app. But in the process, they discovered a good question, which was how can we develop a better photo sharing app? If they hadn't started in the process, that question would not have emerged. So that's a key message of creativity research is you have to start. Even if you don't know where you're going and even if you don't have the big idea, you start and you engage in that process over time and these things will happen. Good questions will emerge. You can't wait until you have the perfect question, right? Because it will come out of the process. Oh, and by the way, it was called bourbon because, because Kevin Systrom loved scotch and bourbon. <laughs> he loved whiskey. As a matter of fact, there was, a, <laughs> there was an interim, you know, I'm talking about the zigzag process. There was an interim app in between bourbon and Instagram, which also was not quite successful. And that app was called Scotch. <laughs> so, so bourbon, scotch, okay, and Instagram. Well, wait a minute, what does Instagram have to do with whiskey? <laughs> I don't know, but hey, it worked, it worked for them. So this is the power of asking good questions, allowing questions to emerge from the process, being receptive to the possibility that you may be seeing the problem not quite the right way. You might be asking the wrong question. Okay, a second of four habits of mind that I found are associated with exceptionally creative individuals. And by the way, these four habits of mind are also grounded in psychological research. Right? We know about problem finding from studies of artists engaging in fine art painting going back to the 1960s. So when I see that happening in entrepreneurial ventures, I'm not surprised because creativity research shows us that problem finding results in greater creativity than problem solving. So it plays out, right? It plays out in the real world. We see it in the lab, we see it in the real world, then that's, that's where I wanna be, right? It's grounded in the research and it works. Okay, the second of four steps, or habits of mind as I call it, looking and how you can be aware. How being aware of the world around you enhances your creative possibility. Um, it's important to emphasize because most of us when we go through our days, uh, we're really focused, right? You have something to do, you've got somewhere to get, you've got this deadline to meet, and you're really good at it, right? That's why you're here, right? You're really good at it. So you're focused and you don't see, it closes in your horizon. So you don't see things that are going on around you and that makes you a lot more efficient. It makes you go down that path much more quickly. But if you can see things, unexpected things, in the environment around you, that will open up possibilities for creative connections that you otherwise might not have. And there's a whole lot of research about how you can do this more effectively, going all the way to mindfulness research. You may have heard of mindfulness as a, a set of habits and practices that will enhance your ability to make these connections. But I'm gonna talk about this fascinating research that came out of a guy in, in England called Richard Wiseman. Richard Wiseman spent a career at this point now studying lucky people. So think about yourselves. Would you say you are a lucky person? So Richard Wiseman would ask people to rate themselves on a scale. Um, all the way over here is exceptionally lucky. Good things happen to me all the time. I don't know why my life is great. <laughs> and over here, so he asked the same people, would you say you're unlucky? And some people say, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty unlucky. You know, last month this thing happened, two years ago this other thing happened. So you got the scale all the way from extremely lucky people to extremely unlucky people. So now he's got a pool of potential subjects. And he then takes the extremely lucky people as one group of subjects, the extremely unlucky people as the other group of subjects, 
and sort of temporarily not thinking about the ones in the middle, just to make the experiment more, more convincing. And he compared these two types of individuals and found all sorts of interesting differences. Lucky people do things differently. And they do things in a way that is consistent with creativity research. Lucky people are more creative. Fascinating, right? When I started studying creativity, I never even thought about luck or lucky people. So here, really compelling experiment that Richard Wiseman did. So he took these two groups of people and he gave them a newspaper, first section of the newspaper. They all got the same newspaper. And he said, OK, here's the first section in the newspaper. I want you to count all the photos in the first section of the newspaper. And then tell me when you finish counting and tell me the number of photos. Uh, so gives the newspaper to the people who said they were unlucky. And they're counting up the photos, right? And they get to the end in about, about two minutes. It takes them about two minutes. And they say 43 photos. And so you know, Wiseman is the stopwatch. And he does this with 20 different unlucky people, averages the time. Then he gives the newspaper to the group that says they're lucky. And he gives them the same instructions. Count the number of photos in the newspaper. Tell me when you're done, and tell me what the number is. And so uh, you're not going to believe this, but the lucky people finished in like two seconds, which is ridiculous, right? The reason why they could do it is because it was a trick newspaper. And here's what it said on page two of the newspaper, right after you open it. It was, he had modified the newspaper that it said this, taking up almost the top, entire top fold. Stop counting, there are 43 photographs in this newspaper. Right, so the, the lucky people are like, okay, 43, I'm done. <laughs> so what were the unlucky people doing? They were looking for photos, and they were not reading. So that's an example of when you're focused, you don't notice things. So this is exactly what I'm talking about with creativity. Yes, you will count those photos a lot faster if you're working like those unlucky people, but then you're going to miss other things that might have made your task significantly easier. So he did experiments like this over and over. He found all sorts of great things. Lucky people are more likely to notice things in their environment that the rest of us might just walk past. Um, lucky people have conversations with more different people. Um, and, I don't, and I don't want you to get the idea that this means you got to be extroverted to be a lucky person, because Wiseman did research on this as well. Lucky people are more often introduce changes to their daily routine, consciously introduce changes to their daily routine. He interviewed one super lucky person who was introverted. Uh, and said, how do you meet people? You're really introverted. You seem to meet a lot of people. And so this man said, yeah, uh, when I go to a party, before I leave the house, I pick a color, um, random color. I say red. I pick red. And then when I get to the event, I force myself to talk to people who are wearing red. <laughs> so it does two things, right? It gets him over his introversion a little bit. But secondly, it's consciously introducing change to his routine. So think about the people you might go up to and talk to without picking a color first. Right? You probably, most of us are going to pick people that maybe are similar to us or people we've seen before, people we recognize. Uh, maybe that person wearing red, you would never go talk to them, right? So this is an incredible, incredible technique for, and I, I highly recommend it, even if you are extroverted. <laughs> You should do this. So yeah, a great example of how lucky people in, increase their possibilities for creativity by expanding the scope of what they introduce into their environment. Uh, here's an example from my life. And this is a picture from the University of North Carolina campus. All right, so I am walking around the campus. And this is after I've been there four years. This, I've now finished five years. So I had a friend of mine visiting. And his daughter was playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> So he was playing Pokemon Go for his daughter. I guess there's a way you can collect things for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, help me out. I haven't done Pokemon Go. So we're walking down a sidewalk, and he finds on his Pokemon Go there's, a, there's an owl sculpture on top of a building on a weather vane. I'm like, what? Owl sculpture? I walk down this sidewalk all the time. So we're looking around, and it's actually this building, which I really do walk by all the time. You can just barely see up there at the top 
that is an owl sculpture, and I have a zoomed in shot here. <laughs> That's the owl. So I'm, and I'm looking up after four years on campus. I'm like, holy shit, that thing's been there all this time, and how could I have not noticed? Because I wasn't looking around, so I'm not following my own advice, right? So I should be looking at the tops of these buildings in the past four years, and I wasn't. So yeah, this is the sort of thing that I would advise you to do as a, as an exercise. Do it tonight when you leave, do it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, Derek will know, because he was my host all day yesterday and then today, and he, uh, incredible uh, fount of knowledge about Princeton, having been an alumni and now back uh, here on the faculty. So he was showing me the campus, and I said, for my talk tomorrow, I want to find something, I want to notice something on campus that's like this. I want to notice something that you might have noticed, something that you walk by all the time, that you might have noticed, but that you didn't notice. So I was like looking around, look, I was looking at the tops of buildings. Uh, I actually, I couldn't find anything that quickly. But I'll leave that to you, and that'll be one of your challenges as you leave. Find something that you might have seen for years now, because you walk that way all the time, and you just didn't notice it before. And now once you've seen it, now, now you'll always see it, right? So it's that practice, you can engage in these activities, you can engage in these exercises, which will work that muscle to help you get in that mindset of looking for things that normally you would just look right by, right? So that's the power of this mindfulness and this awareness. And we know it works as psychological researchers because one of the core findings of creativity research is that new ideas come from combinations of existing ideas. Okay, no, no particular surprise there. You got ideas in your mind, combine two of them, you get a new idea, it's a combination. But what's surprising is creativity researchers have found that if you combine two ideas that are more different from each other, distant combinations we call them, and if you can get them together, you're more likely to have a surprising breakthrough innovation. So that's why this practice of mind of looking at things and noticing unexpected things, it gives you that potential to bring something in that you normally wouldn't have gotten into your mind and it gives you that possibility for that distant connection to happen. Like right, normally when you're, you're looking at the same stuff all the time, your mind is filled with things that are closely connected with each other. For that exceptional creativity, you want those distant connections. So you have to reach out. And the third practice is gonna continue that thought. Um, I call it fuse because you're combining ideas. So this is an activity, I actually got this one from a senior executive who flies on airplanes all the time. And so I thought this was a great idea. What he does and what I've started doing is when he is traveling, and which I've started <laughs> doing quite a bit, um, this is a photo that I took in the Raleigh-Durham airport just before I left to come here. And you know, anyone who's been in an airport, you know, airports have bookstores, they have newsstands. Where else are you gonna see so many <laughs> magazines anywhere except at an airport, right? So I go to the airport newsstand and I buy about five or six magazines. And I buy five or six magazines that are about things I don't know anything about. And they're mostly things I don't care anything about. But I'm not buying it for the topic of the magazine. Um, I'm buying it to stretch my mind for those distant connections. So actually I have brought the magazines with me <laughs> that, that I purchased. Oh, here, can you hold that? Thank you. So these are the magazines I chose to purchase, uh, and you can see, if you know anything about my personality, you don't have to know much about my personality to know these are not something I read all the time. This one is a model airplane magazine, and uh, I've gone through and fascinating pictures of cool model airplanes. <laughs> um, Tiger Beat, Tiger Beat magazine, does anybody know what this is? Just a few, so, so what is it? They, yes, they are teen boy bands. Like, oh look, here's a centerfold like thing. Oh. Sean Wend Mendes. Sorry, I'm not up on culture. <laughs> so you've you've heard of this guy? Yeah. So this and it's been around for what a long time. So it's still here, Tiger Bee Magazine. 
and, oh, and I'll show you three more, but the reason why I do this is I, I think about a problem that I'm having, which in my case right now is I have too much administrative work at my university and I wish I could go write my book because I love writing books and I hate administrative work. So I go through these magazines and I find pictures um, that I sort of have just feel to me like there's maybe a metaphorical connection. Somehow something about the photo just rings, rings true. And so I get a pair of scissors and I'll cut out the photos and put them all together. Uh, and uh, I'll show you in a minute. So, but, oh, I always like to get Cosmopolitan magazine, <laughs> a, a great source of interesting photos. Uh, <laughs> And quite often I will get uh, Oprah's magazine, O, oh, but I didn't, Oprah wasn't really ringing out to me from the newsstand this time. Uh, then I got, oh, horse magazine. This is one I have never bought before. For horse fanciers, does anyone get this magazine? Come on, we're in Princeton, there's horses all over the place, right? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so there are, I, the, the picture I cut out of horse magazine it's an article about how to brush your horse's teeth. <laughs> oh, and Great Lakes Angler. Wait, we're, not, we're nowhere near the Great Lakes, but, but anyway, Great, Great Lakes Angler. So that's the sort of thing, and here's my collage. See? Didn't take much time. So it's the same sort of thing. I go through the magazine, I clip out photos that have a sort of loose connection to things I'm interested in, and I'm gonna take this home with me, and I'll take a look at it on the airplane. Uh, most of the time when I do this, nothing happens. You know, I have a little bit of fun with some scissors. And maybe uh, I've got this really cool picture of like some kind of bait on a hook. <laughs> but yeah, but sometimes I get that connection, right? So this is the sort of thing, it's the habit of mind and the daily practice that is aligned with research that is more likely to consistently lead you to these small ideas, right? This is not gonna make me have a huge insight. And that, I'm not expecting that. Think if I get like the tiniest little inspiration that helps me move forward on the process, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the small ideas to consistently come over time. A set of practices, ways of thinking and ways of acting that will consistently cause those small sparks of ideas to emerge. And that's the nature of the creative process. That's how you move forward. Oh, thanks, Derek. So it's these sorts of exercises, these sorts of activities, they're all grounded in basic cognitive research and how the mind works when people are being creative. And then you engage in a set of practices or exercises that are based on these, like the research on distant connections. Um, okay, the fourth, and this will be the, the final one I talk about today, is one I call making. And this is based on a ton of research on the importance of externalizing your thought getting something out there into the world, not just keeping it in your head, right? If you got it in your head, a lot of us, especially on university campuses, including me, I'm, I'm a very head-focused person, right? So uh, it's really hard for me to get things out. I like to sit there and keep thinking about it. So much research shows that that's not the best way to be creative. It, it really helps if you can take your ideas, take your thoughts and externalize them into the world, make something. Make something that is what you're thinking about. And it's not gonna be easy. You're thinking about some big, complicated thing. You're gonna make something tiny in whatever, an hour, that's gonna seem not to capture this big thing you're thinking about. But the key is that it's something. It's gotta be something that's visible, that you can touch. That physicality of the object results in a kind of embodied experience where you're having a, almost like a dialogue with this part of yourself that you have put there out into the world. And it's that dialogue that drives the creative process forward because it gives you, um, gives you like a, a seed for a crystal to form. It's part of why universities are installing maker spaces uh, all over the country. And I'm a huge supporter of maker spaces. Anything that gets people down and dirty, making stuff, whether, whether it's, you don't need a 3D printer, right? It can be cardboard, it can be plywood, uh, anything where, like I said, down and dirty. Your screwdriver, using a screwdriver, and look, I've got a screwdriver and hammer here. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a story again where my, my whole goal is to connect psychological research with real world examples of successful creativity. So that it takes the research from the laboratory and brings it to you, right? And helps you understand how you can use it in your life and in your organization. 
I'm going to tell a story about an innovation that emerged from a company called W.L. Gore. And it's famous for the Gore-Tex waterproof fabrics. Um, Gore-Tex waterproof fabrics have been around forever. Gosh, I think I had some in the 1980s. But what most people don't know is that Gore is an innovation powerhouse. They are known for hundreds of products in something like 15 different industry sectors. I mean, Gore is just constantly innovating. So as innovation researchers, a lot of people have gone to Gore and uh, try to figure out what is that magic that makes them work. And so that was me as well. I said, what is going on with Gore? One thing I really liked about Gore when I'm studying creativity is that it's a manufacturing company. And a lot of the stories you'll read about innovation or design thinking, it's some software company in California, right? And if you're not a software company in California, sometimes those stories kind of just lay flat. They kind of go over your head. Yeah, those flaky guys out in California, they can do that. But you know, I've got an auto plant to run. So here is Gore. They're actually making stuff in factories. And they're one of the most innovative companies in the United States. So what's going on? Gore-Tex, they're famous for that. But they're famous for all sorts of other products you might not even know were invented by Gore. This Glide Dental Floss, which I personally love to dental floss. So I use lots of this Glide Dental Floss. Actually, less than other dental floss because it's coated with a friction-free coating, so it slides through your teeth better. And you can see it says Oral-B. This brand was purchased by Procter & Gamble years ago, but it's still made in a Gore factory. Right? So Gore makes stuff. Uh, that's what I'm saying. This is, this is important, that they actually make things in real factories. So the innovation process at Gore, they really focus on how can we continually innovate over time. They have instituted a set of practices, incentive systems, and cultural attitudes that make collaboration uh, more not only possible, but more likely. I'm going to tell you a story about how one of their successful products emerged from a zigzagging and wandering process that only would have happened if someone was making something in the world. There was an engineer who worked at their Flagstaff, Arizona facility, which was primarily involved with medical products. Gore does a big business in medical innovation medical products, I don't know, stents, surgical tools. Um, out in Arizona, this particular engineer liked to mountain bike, off-road mountain biking, uh, in his off time. And he had this problem that when you're riding a mountain bike, you, or any bike, so imagine the bike, and imagine the brake cables. You know, They go from the brakes, they go down to the wheels, right? the brake pads on the wheels. So that when you squeeze the brake pads, the, the cable pulls. and pulls the brake pads closed. Same thing with the gear shifters. When you turn the gear shifters, there are wires. Um, and they're covered with this rubber housing to keep rain and dirt and mud from getting on them. But what happened when, when he was biking in the desert, uh, sand, flecks of sand would get inside the housing. And then they would sit in there. They'd sit in there. And when you're trying to shift, the cable would get stuck. It was causing friction. So it was actually kind of ironic that it was uh, making the problem worse. So he's, man, this, this sucks. What can I do about this? Maybe I can use our you know, dental floss technology somehow. If I could put a coating on that cable, and it would allow it to slide more smoothly through the housing, and even if there's dust in there, that it would be more friction free. So it's kind of like a Teflon coating that you spray on the outside of the cable. And it causes this shifting problem. By the way, it was a huge problem if you're a competitive biker. It really showed up, because you'd be trying to make a gear shift, and it would be a second too late. And that is enough that you could actually lose the race. So the, this was big business. This product was successful, right? Because if you're going to be a competitive off-road biker, you pretty much had to, had to buy this. So the engineer who worked on this is finished with this product. He's thinking, what am I going to do next? At Gore, you're given 10%. I think at Gore, it's 15%. 15% of every week to work on any product you want to work on. Just something wild and crazy, some new innovation. The ride-on brand of bicycle cables came out of this 15% time. And so now you're done. <laughs> I got 15% every week. Now what am I going to do with it? Um, and he thought, you know, there's got to be some more potential in this technology. I can friction-free coating of a cable. Uh, other friction-free coatings of stuff. Uh, so yeah, I'll ask for your help. So let's say you had this technology. You could take a cable, and you could coat it with a friction-free <coughs> and invisible substance. 
um, what might you use it for? And I, by the way, I can guarantee you whatever you say, it's not going to be what he thought of. So this is not a getting the answer right question. Just, yeah, what, are you, what would you use it for? <coughs> a drone for how the things come up and down because all that comes from So the, the legs on the drone. OK, great. So sure, it's the legs on a drone. Uh, OK, great. Uh, let's hear another one. Good, good, yeah, because I did say he worked in the medical industry sector. So yeah, there could be some benefit to going through organs or tissue, right, right? Um, so okay, so all of you will have something in your mind. Force yourself to do that. But like I said, I guarantee it wasn't what he came up with. He was at his son's birthday party at a Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, this is the best photo I could find online of a Chuck E. Cheese. So if any of you have been to Chuck E. Cheese, it's been a long time for me. They have these animated rats and other kinds of rodents. Wait, wait, wait aren't they rats? Oh, yeah. Kind of disgusting. Sorry, I'm not a big fan of these. They look kind of dated. So this engineer, he's looking at this, and he's, and he's thinking, these puppets must be controlled by cables. And I bet these cables are really old. And I bet they're really old cable technology. I could invent the next generation puppet control cable. So that's his idea. I'm going to spend my 15% of time every week working on Gore's puppet control cable. And he does. He works on this for months and months. Uh, what he does to work on it is he has a, a friend down the street who plays guitar. And so you know, when you play guitar, you're changing your strings all the time. So he says, can I have your old strings when you take them off? Uh, and I'll use them for my prototypes. And the guy's sure. So he, every couple of weeks when you're changing your strings, if you play a lot, he gets a new set of six strings. So he's spraying this friction-free stuff on these old guitar strings, and he's hooking them up to you know, puppet parts, you know, pivots and arms made of wood. He just does this stuff in his garage. Right? This is making. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to do something. You have to make it visible in the world. So. After a few months of this, he realizes, eh, it wasn't that good an idea after all. The world doesn't really need another puppet control cable. Right? Going back, it's echoing that story. The world doesn't really need another location sharing app. So he was asking the wrong question. But he looked down at his pile of prototypes, right? these old guitar strings, and then he had another small idea. Maybe this would be a good guitar string. Maybe there's something I could get out of a guitar string that's coated with this kind of substance. Um, so he goes to the guitarist and, how would this work? The guitarist says, oh, absolutely. This could be great, because the reason why I need to give you my old strings every three weeks is because the oils from my fingers get into the string, and they deaden the sound. And then microscopic flecks of dead skin get into those coils, and they deaden the sound. So I have to take the strings off. I don't have that bright, new guitar string sound anymore. So if you could prevent that from happening by coating the string, I would spend any amount of money for that. And so the dollar signs go off over said any amount of money. And in fact, it is true. Guitarist uh, ended up, this was an incredibly successful product. They did indeed release a new improved guitar string. And it is called the Elixir brand. So does anybody play guitar? Does anybody have these strings? No, no guitarist? OK, no guitarist in the audience. but. Usually, if there is a guitarist when I give this talk, they will be using Elixir guitar strings. An incredibly successful product. They released it into the market at three times the cost of every other guitar string. There were music stores who were saying, we won't carry your product because it costs too much, and we'll never sell it at that price. The music stores were wrong. <laughs> Once you try this, you're going to want it forever. And now, of course, they have imitators, like probably every other successful product. But they've stayed on top. So it's another example of the zigzagging, wandering process that you start asking in one question, does the world need a better public control cable? And you realize that's the wrong question. So the new question emerges from engaging in the process. In this case, the process of making something. Right? If he didn't have those guitar string prototypes, if he hadn't been hooking them up to pulleys and pieces of wood, if he hadn't been staring down unhappily <laughs> at his pile of prototypes, he wouldn't have had the idea for the guitar strings. So you have to engage in the making to have this process pushed forward. Make stuff, get stuff out there in the world. 
that's uh, an incredibly important aspect of the creative process. So I'm getting to the end here where I'll give you my take home message. I've talked to you about four different habits of mind that are likely to increase your ability and your success at getting through the creative process. And the creative process is a particular kind of process. It's not linear. The linear view of creativity is the same as the brilliant insight view of creativity. It's this view that I've got to wait for a big insight, the light bulb's going to go off over my head, and then I'm going to take that idea, make sure nobody else sees it, by the way. It's my idea. You get that possessiveness to it. And then you take that idea and you execute it over time, and it's a fairly linear process. It's the idea, now all I have to do is make it. Well, that's not the way creativity works. And great creativity, successful creativity, you'll hear those stories, the stories of invention that you hear. You'll hear about Samuel Morse and the telegraph, uh, a really interesting story about how he was taking a transatlantic voyage, and he was talking to some electrician, and he had the idea for how you could communicate over the wires. Um, so the mythical story that you always hear involves someone being alone somewhere, far away from everything, and hearing something that causes a spark, having the big idea. So that's not the way the telegraph was invented, and it wasn't invented by Samuel Morse. It's not the way the telephone was invented. It wasn't by Alexander Graham Bell either. It's not the way the light bulb was invented, and it wasn't invented by Thomas Edison. So yeah, you, once uh, this is fascinating to me. Once I start scratching beneath the surface, I see this over and over. And so I, I kind of I keep looking. I keep looking. There's got to be one case somewhere in history where someone had a big flash of insight, and it totally proves my theory wrong. Right? So there's got to be one. But I haven't found it yet. Every time I scratch beneath the surface, I see the wandering, zigzagging process. That's the nature of successful creativity. You don't wait for a big flash of insight at the beginning and then expect a linear process to take you through. You start not knowing where you're going. You have to start not knowing where you're going. You start not really being sure what the nature of the problem is, but not really being committed to any one particular framing of the problem. But you have to start, and you have to start not knowing what the end is going to look like. You don't know where it's going to end up because it's got that zigzagging, wandering process. And it's, um, I mean, it's difficult, right? People like certainty. People like to know what they're doing and where they're going. This kind of process, you don't know how long it's going to take, right? It, you can't predict. It, you could be done in a week. You could be done in three months. Uh, people like to know they have a deadline. Right? We have to finish in three weeks. We can't take three months. So there are situations where this is a, a really hard process to handle. But if you want that creativity to emerge from the process, this is really the way, the way it has to work. It's small ideas over time. You start not knowing where you're going. You don't know where you're going, sometimes until very close to the end, through that wandering process. In many cases, you don't know how close you are to the end. Uh, some psychologists did studies of what they called warmthness ratings, where they asked people, how warm, you know that old game you play, how, how warm am I, how close am I to the solution? And so they would ask people, how, how close do you think you are to the solution to this creative challenge? Um, people who were more creative didn't know how close they were to the solution. They, they couldn't tell. They, but they were OK with that, because they trust the process. The people who know exactly how close they are to the solution They've already envisioned the solution, so they've taken themselves away from the possibility for a zigzagging, wandering process. So it's challenging to do personally, right? Because you've got to look inside yourself, and you've got to make yourself comfortable with that uncertainty, with not knowing. Uh, and to trust something, especially the first few times you do it, to trust something that you don't know. You haven't had the experience of it working. But uh, it's going to work. It takes some time to trust it. But you focus on the small wins, if you will, small sparks of ideas that you can have really every day. Have several of them every week. Every week. Uh, it's pretty important to keep a notebook so you can write these things down. That's the oldest creativity advice in the book, is always have a notebook with you. Have a place you can record your ideas. And those small ideas, you have to look back at them. Because as I've said, no one small idea is going to be the solution. The solution is the ideas coming together over time. So you keep connecting them in a way that each idea emerges from the ideas before and then drives forward the ideas that are going to come afterwards. That process over time, it's wandering, it's improvisational, 
It's a zigzag process, and it's the core of every creativity from every human going decades, even centuries back. And certainly what we have today to be more creative, engage in the zigzag. Thank you. Oh yeah, okay, so we have time for questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. I love questions, so. Um, so I guess, first of all, thank you so much for this amazing presentation, because like a lot of things you said really like, like resonated with me, because personally, I really like visual art. I want to be like a creative, like I want to go into a creative industry. And a thing that has been on my mind, or like a question that I constantly have, is sort of like this, uh, the skill of like, sort of like this idea of like depth versus breadth in a way, like width or whatever. In terms of like, when I think about what I want to, what I want to focus on in terms of what I study, what I practice, how to like make the best out of my time. Um, for example, I really like art. How much time should I spend on like focusing, practicing like specific artistic skills versus like how much time should I like like just branch out and like sort of be more open-minded and like kind of like look for things. Like if that makes sense for you, like I kind of was wondering like what do you think about sort of like that duality there? Right, the duality. So I think I understand it's the balance. It's true that you really do need to focus yeah. some of the time uh, just to get the work done. And then others of the time that you're sort of releasing your focus and becoming more aware of the world. So yes, if you did that all the time, you would not get any work done. And if you focus all the time, you'll get work done, but you won't be creative. Um, so it's a, it's a good question how you balance. There is a lot of creativity, creativity research showing that to be exceptionally creative in an area, you have to spend a lot of time in the area. You have to be an expert in that area. So creativity is domain specific. Uh, we say as creativity researchers that what I've been telling you about is domain general aspects of creativity. So these practices and habits of mind, you can use these no matter what sphere of life you're engaged in. So that gets you about you know, close to 50% of creativity is domain general. But then the rest of it is domain specific, meaning that you really do have to focus. You have to master a particular domain. And so when you put those two things together, you've got the mastery of your domain getting you, let's say, 50% roughly the domain specific creativity. Then you master habits of mind like this and get the domain general aspects of creativity, then, then you've got it all, right? But, uh, but yes, that's a, I'm, I'm kind of answering a different question than what you asked, but to emphasize that it's important to know stuff <laughs> in an area, and it's important to be able to focus uh, and be knowledgeable. But, uh, and yeah, so it's, I guess I can't give a simple answer to what's the right balance. I think it's gonna go in flux, right? So you could enter a phase of your creative process where you need more of the second uh, discipline I talked about, which was look. You get to a point where you really need to expand out. It Probably if you're feeling stuck, that would be a good time to stop focusing and move out because getting that other stimuli in brings in that possibility of new and distant connections. So I hope, I hope that's a little helpful, but thank you. Okay, here, and then over here. So uh, this question is coming from somebody who's totally left brain. Doesn't feel like I have a creative bone in my body. What does what does your research say about nature versus nurture? Is somebody like me never really going to be able to be creative, or somebody who's you know naturally or is that a misconception? Um, oh, you're setting yourself up there. Yes, it's a misconception. <laughs> no, there. And I said briefly at the beginning of my talk, there is no such thing as a creative person as in personality trait, or as in cognitive makeup, or whatever you want to call it. Um, no, there's no evidence that creativity is a personality trait. And because if there were, you know, part of the definition that psychologists use for traits is they're relatively stable properties of individuals. If it's a trait, it's not changing every two minutes or every five days. It's, it's a stable thing. You're extroverted, you're going to be extroverted for years. <laughs> And I'm very extroverted, uh, and always have been. So yeah, so personality traits, they could be innate. 
Um, but there aren't many of them. I mean, I'm not a personality trait researcher, but creativity isn't one. Uh, creativity is a set of practices, ways of thinking, and ways of acting that can be learned. Um, so yes, and I'm very left-brained as well. Um, so I'm fine with <laughs> being left-brained and believing that it can be creative. So you would say you're not a creative person. And so when you look at this kind of talk, do you say, I could never do that? Or? I'm hopeful that I could based off of your talk. But before this, I, I would have assumed it's more, uh, more of a nature, a nature thing. Like you know, somebody is kind of bored and more inclined to think a certain way, perhaps. And, and therefore, and maybe that's just a, a matter of uh, repetition over the, you know, over the course of a lifetime. Right, right. So yeah, so that's good news for you and other left brain people. Is uh, these are habits of my practices? I think you, when you look at them, they're not mysterious, right? I mean, anyone could do these things, uh, and research shows that anyone who does them will become more creative. You don't have to be right brain to do these things and learn from them. It's uh, like I said, it's a set of practices and behaviors in the world that is associated with greater creativity. Creativity is about acting and doing. It's about making something. I'd say that even more than thinking. You know, it's, creativity isn't about sitting in the room and thinking really hard until a big flash comes out. You know, you're in there doing stuff. You're doing the work. You're getting your hands dirty. You're engaged in that process. I mean, you know, the good news is you can be more creative. I guess the, maybe the bad news is that it's hard work. I mean, you can't just, OK, I'm going to be creative now. Bring it on, right? No, you, this is hard work. You got to do the work. You got to make the stuff. You have to start when you don't know where you're going. It's frustrating. It's ambiguous. It, it can make you miss a deadline. Uh, it, you know, it's it's hard work. So that's the bad news. But the good news is, if you're willing to put in the hard work, then yes, anyone could get to that point of being extremely creative. Oh yeah, I had three questions in a bunch over here. I think she was first though. Uh, you've written about flow. Uh, can you briefly comment on how that affects the four, any of the four habits you talked about, or was it five, six, seven? Right, right. Good question. Yes, uh, my dissertation advisor was a man named Dr. Mike Csikszentmihalyi, who was famous for the concept of flow, the psychology of optimal experience. And flow is a peak state of experience where you lose track of time. You just love what you're doing so much that you aren't even thinking that you love it, right? You're, you're just completely absorbed by the task. And I hope for all of you that this happens because it is a peak experience, a peak sense of fulfillment. And it's very closely related to creativity research because there's a lot of research showing that when you're in the flow state, you're more likely to have good creative ideas. So flow state and creativity are related. So yes, if we could be in flow more often, we could be uh, potentially more creative more often. Uh, I think that's the sort of thing you're going for, right? Um, and I've also done a lot of work on jazz ensembles and improvisational theater groups. As a result of that, I developed a concept I call group flow, when the group collectively gets into this flow state of peak experience. But it's group peak experience, right? It's the sort of thing when you're improvising, I'm a jazz pianist, so when you're improvising with a group and you really do get lost in the moment, there's so much you have to pay attention to. There's a drummer, there's a bass player, uh, there's a saxophone player, and you like the chord changed in a strange way because the bass player did something. Um, and you didn't know, and you have to do something totally different. Yeah, it completely absorbs your mind. And if it matches your skill level, then you reach the flow state. That's basically the core of the flow state is the challenges of the task matching your skill level. And, and yeah, it's associated with greater creativity, sometimes called intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation drives creativity. Extrinsic motivation tends to reduce creativity. And when I say extrinsic motivation, I mean grades, money. <laughs> Let's stop there, grades and money. Things that we all face every day. Um, ask me later about how you can get around that stuff. Um, OK, I think you were next. And then we're here. Uh, so my question kind of more concerns application, and the argument can definitely be made that pretty much any field has, creativity can be applied to any field, whether it's empirical, quantitative, or not. 
But what if you're in a field where you are very deadline focused or you are supposed to have to do one job and do it really well? Do you have any suggestions for people who might be in a very limited, might operate in a very limited scope and might not have that room to kind of exercise this sort of creativity? Right. Um, yeah, I can imagine. A, I know a lot of people who are in jobs where they don't need to be creative, and they probably are maybe told not to. They wouldn't be told not to be creative, but they would be told do this this way. And if you don't do it that way, I'm going to come over and tell you again to do it that way. So yeah, there are lots of jobs like that. I, you know, I I wouldn't want to advise you to lose your job by not listening to the boss. So I'm not sure what you're getting at. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so I could, I, I should have a second career as an executive coach, because like or a career coach. Is here's the, what don't you like about this job, and maybe you should try this other career. Um, I mean, in some cases, you might just have to leave uh, if you want a job where you're allowed to, or enabled or even required to be creative. Um, in some rare situations, you might be able to very cleverly, if you have great organizational skills, you might be able to somehow interact with other people in the organization to identify a more creative way you could rearrange the work um, so that it wouldn't be so repetitive. But that involves a lot of organizational skill. and It's hard to do, and in most cases, you can't do it. So yeah, so I'm, I'm going to stop trying to be a career coach. But, um, but yes, always, when you're not at work, um, what I do is I repair accordions. Now, is that creative? Yeah, I would say so, but you might not. <laughs> but, but, okay, yeah. Yeah, are there some um, key or like standard questions that you can ask yourself or a group in certain situations to kind of train um, the habit or skill of asking the right question? Oh, you're asking some advice about how you could do that? Yeah, like if there are some, some standard questions that you can ask yourself to become better at finding new problems. And oh, yeah, absolutely. So this uh, habit of mind I call ask, or uh, coming up with discovering really good problems that you might not have at first. So that's one of the chapters in my book, ZigZag. And I've got something, I, I think it's 15 different exercises you can engage in. Is that the sort of thing you're asking? Is like, how can I practice yeah. this ability to ask good questions? Yeah, one that I sometimes put in a presentation like this, if I have a longer time slot, is uh, just um, think about something and ask 10 questions about it. Could be anything, like the floor. The floor in this room. Come up with 10 questions about the floor. And you're going to kind of run out of steam after three questions, right? So you really have to force yourself to get to 10 questions. Um, so that's the kind of exercise you're doing. You're exercising your ability to think of questions. By the time you get to question number nine or 10, I guarantee it's going to be a question that you never, ever thought you would ask about floors <laughs> before you did that exercise. So yeah, so things like that, uh, that I have some in the book. Uh, so yes, absolutely, uh, you can engage in this kind of practice and increase your ability to ask questions. So I work in the technology licensing office at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, and our bread and butter is invention disclosures. So every year, our task is to motivate the scientists and engineers to put their inventions down on paper. And year after year, it's the 80-20 rule. 20, the same 20% of the scientists give us 80% of the invention disclosures. How do I mine that other 80% of people who don't think that way or, or how do I mot motivate the other 80% to give me their ideas? Right, right. Um, so I, I know just to, enough to be dangerous, because we have such a department at our university. So um, I think this is a situation where the researchers are doing grant-funded research in laboratories, is probably cutting edge, and is discovering new molecules or proteins. Or, um, and they don't know anything about markets or business or drugs. They just love molecules. <laughs> so once a year, you want them to tell you, here's the cool new molecules I created in my lab. 
And then you have a staff of people that are going to go look at all these disclosures to see if anything's worth patenting. Because investing in a patent takes an amount of time and research. So, so then out of what percentage of all those disclosures result in a patent? Very small percentage. Very small percentage. Less than 10%. Right, but you need the input to get the output, right? So, and it could be likely that those scientists that aren't disclosing may also be having patentable discoveries. Potentially. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I could go on about this a lot because I love talking about IP law. Actually, I was at a, um, an IP law conference. I have a law journal, a law review journal piece on IP law where I, I'm, honestly I'm fairly uh, critical of our current patent regime and it's not very well aligned with the science of how creativity works. But I know you didn't ask that question. <laughs> if anybody in the room uh, wants to talk about patent law, uh, I could go off on that. But you want to know how can you get them to, I don't, I don't know. At our university, we have people who like go knock on doors. You probably do too. We do seminars on what is what is innovation, what is patentable, what is. But it's the same people, and it, you know, you're preaching to the choir. Who comes to the seminar? The people that invent. Right, right. It's hard to reach out to those who are not interested. Right. Well, good. I guess maybe a general message. So I'm going to shift to a general message that, you know, so scientists are doing work in their labs. They love it. It's cool. That's the way I am too. I sit in my office. I write all sorts of academic articles that only that are very technical and academic, and um, and I love doing it. And then you know I'm lucky that other people are interested in creativity, so I can come out of my lab and talk to somebody about the real world, and that my research actually does have some implications for people. So like I said, my passion is helping people be more creative, and. It's wonderful. I, you know, I could imagine I could do creativity research, which wouldn't be of interest to anybody, I suppose. I, but, uh, but yeah, I love doing it. I'm gr it's great to be here and to have your interest in these types of questions and to help further my own mission, which is to help people be more creative. So thank you so much for coming out. I understand. Yeah. Uh, so there, we have food and drinks in the back. I invite you to stick around and ask uh, more questions.